Okay, we are back for chapter 15. And chapter 15 is called Mountain. Mountain is chapter 15. So here we go. I turn away from my only friend and I walk on along the lake shore. The cool mud is soft under my feet. I search for the tracks of a wolf among all the duck and deer and the coyote prints. There is plenty of everything here, except the one thing. I want more than any water or food. There is no sign that any wolf has passed this way. There are more things to eat than I can name and nobody to eat them with. Still, I cannot be downcast with a full belly and a star-speckled sky. I have missed traveling by night. I've missed the chill of the mountains. I have been thirsty for clouds and mist and rain. Here on the flat ground, even the moonlight is relentless. The ground around me stretches out in every direction. It all looks exactly the same. I pause and I taste the wind. Lake water and birds are to one side of me, and nothing but sagebrush everywhere else. The rat-a-tat call of the frogs in the lake makes me shudder. I tried a frog once because Sharp dared me to do it. It was the worst thing I have ever eaten. All slime on the outside and bitter in the middle. Even Wag, who once dug up a hornet's nest, knew better than to eat frogs. Pounce mocked me for days. I am never going to eat anything with spots ever again. Where in all of this land would wolves live? There is food aplenty, but nothing feels like home to me. I turn away from the water by the time the sun comes up. The lake is a silver-blue shimmer far behind me, and a mountain lies on the horizon. It's single. It's a single mountain, but I am drawn to it anyway. Elk, like a sloping meadow. If there is a wolf anywhere, it will be on a mountain. I move faster now that I can see my footing clearly. Rising ground and crisp air are welcome changes. There are a few thin stripes of snow reaching down from the peak, so I know that there will be water above me. I climb at a steady pace. The pale green clumps of sagebrush give way to darker green junipers. The trees are few and far apart here, and smaller than the ones that I knew when I was growing up. They aren't hiding anything good to eat. I can smell marmots from somewhere in the cliffs and boulder fields ahead of me. They have the good sense to hold so still that I cannot see them. Unlike the ground squirrels, who have no sense of any kind and dash out of cover without even looking for danger, they are not worth the trouble of hunting. A mouthful of stripes and a squeak, that's all you get. Even bears who eat everything under the sun, including moths, hardly bother with a ground squirrel. As I climb, trees give way to open meadows with every kind of flower in the world. I zigzag all across the green, yellow, orange, blue of it, and I tell myself I'm looking for some sign of deer or elk to eat, but I'm still full from yesterday. What I really want <clears throat> is a scent or track, or tuft of hair from another wolf. This is a mountain. A mountain. There should be wolves. I have run for days and days, and the moon has gone from fat to thin, and is growing fatter again. Ever since I crossed the Black River, I have not seen a single wolf scat. No paw prints, no scent marks, I had brothers and sisters, a whole pack. I never imagined that the world would be so big or that I could be so alone in it. I remember the wolf on the shore of the Black River, the one I drove away. I am not sorry that I saved her from being crushed by new noisemakers. I wanted her to live, but I never wanted to be alone. There must be wolves somewhere, if only I knew which way to turn. 
I stop on a ridge top at midday, and I find a sheltered spot between the boulders where the tall grasses cover me. A pair of vultures soars back and forth on the rising air. The drowsy hum of bees lulls me to sleep, and in my dream I hear the far-off drumming of hooves. In my dream, elk are running toward me, more elk than I could ever eat, and wolves following after them. They come closer and closer, and when they are almost close enough to touch, I startle awake, alone on a bare, windy mountaintop. They were so close. I bark a hopeful call, even though I know it was only a dream. Echoes come back to tease me, and my head slumps to the ground. How can there be so much land and no wolves? I heave a sigh, and then I feel the ground tremble. I listen, smell all around me, but there is no hint of elk. I keep my neck and chin pressed flat to the rock. The ground trembles like it does when elk are on the move. I am not dreaming. The shiver on the skin of the earth grows. There is no... There is no elk smell. After a while, I can hear the hoofbeats coming up the mountain. They sound wrong. Something is off about the rhythm. I can get to my feet, but keep low and ready to run in case there is trouble. I listen for the high-pitched calls elk make when they travel, but all I can hear is low, snorting grunts. It's very strange. Whatever they are, there are many of them. I see their cloud of dust first, and then they come over the rise. It's horses. Horses are the pack mates of men. They always came into our mountains together. They took food from each other. I look smell for men. The usual trap that sticks a man to a horse's back is gone. The lead horse is rounder than the rest, and the one at the back is the tallest. When they come to the open meadow below me, they slow to walk to a walk and then stop to graze. The two smallest nip at each other's necks and have a race around the others. The tall one walks around the edge of the meadow, smelling the wind for trouble. He keeps an eye on the wrestling match, and when the yearlings get too close to the sheer cliff, at the, at the one end of the meadow, he nudges them away from danger and settles their fight with one well-placed nip. He's the father of the pack, plain to see. The horses are all coyote-colored, with black manes, tails, and legs, and one long stripe down the back. The leader of the group, the fattest of them, circles the meadow until she finds a patch of snow in the shadow of an overhanging rock. She kicks a few chunks free and nibbles a drink of snow. Then she goes back to pacing in slower and slower circles. There is something odd about the lead horse's smell. It's almost like the red that runs from an elk when you kill it, but not quite. It's a little bit like... Like the dark goo that runs out of the guts when you bite into them. But that is not quite right either. I am certain I have never smelled this before. The father can smell it too. He curls up his upper lip and then breathes it in. He moves closer to the lead horse and talks to her gently. He nose touches her and lets her rest against his shoulder. I cannot look away from their tenderness. It reminds me of warm and our days together in the den. I hold completely still in the tall grass, and I watch. The smell that I cannot figure out grows stronger. It's a a wild smell, a sharp smell, and something about it makes me hungry. The round horse walks more and more slowly, and she lies down in the grass and then gets up. Water and a little bit of red runs down her back legs. Could she be sick? She lies down one more time and the father stands guard over her. The other horses come around one by one and touch noses with her. Something is going on here.
The lying down horse starts to shudder. The smell grows more pungent every moment, and I see more water spilling out. Something is definitely going on here. I might, it might be something delicious. I sit on my wag and I wait. The father gives encouraging snorts and grunts, and after a while a great bulge comes out the back of the horse. A sticky black bulge. It is the most disgusting, fascinating thing I have ever seen. I cannot look away. The lying down horse breathes in great shuddering breaths. The black bulge grows longer and stickier. This is not like any sickness I have ever seen. And still the father stands watch, faithful and strong. Shadows grow longer and the air cools. A sprinkle of rain falls. I lick the drops from the long grass, but I still I cannot stop watching. The horse struggles to stand, and she gets halfway up and only to flop back down as her bulge grows longer and longer. And then the slimy black thing splits open. Two feet, feet with hooves and knees that bend. I cannot believe it. There is a tiny horse inside that bulge, and the mother is having the little horse right in the middle of her family. No den, no burrow, nothing. And here's a picture. So you have all the horses, the mama horse here on the ground. All of her family is right there watching and talking to her, touching her nose to nose. The grunts and cries go on and then a head comes out all wrapped in the same sack that covers the legs. The father nips at the sack and the head breaks free. The mother tries to half stand and the rest of it comes out in a whoosh of waters and a burst of delicious smells. Okay, that's the end of that chapter.